Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's Hubble Hangout. My name is Tony Darnell. I work at the Space Telescope Science Institute, and we've done it again. We've got another great Hubble Hangout planned for you this, this week. Astronomers using the Hubble Space Telescope have generated the most accurate statistical description yet of faint early galaxies as they existed in the universe 500 million years after the Big Bang. And we're going to talk about these findings in just a little bit uh, with, with the, some of the astronomers that have made these, uh, the, these uh, analyses uh, public to us. But before I get started, uh, I got something I want to say real quick. I, I just found this out yesterday. Now, sometimes before a Hubble Hangout, what I'll do is I'll go on Periscope and I'll do a Hubble Q&A and I'll talk with you guys a little bit maybe to get some people jazzed up about the Hangout. But it always ends up turning into a sort of a JWST Q&A more than that because everybody's interested about the new mission and how it's coming up, how it's coming along. And everybody always at some point will ask me the same question. Aren't we worried about launching JWST out at the L2 point and what if something get, what if it gets hit by something or what if it, something goes wrong with it? And it occurred to me yesterday that, you know, this is actually a solved problem. We solved this problem because there's a, when I first started my career in astronomy, I started in the solar physics area. And there's a, there is a spacecraft that we launched back in, let's see, December 2nd, 1995. And it was built by the Europeans and operated by uh, the European Space Agency. But NASA had like 12 or 13 instruments on it as well. And they put it out at the L1 point, which is this point in between Earth and the Sun. We're going to put JWST at L2, which is a million miles away, and it's behind the Earth, so it's you know it's at a it's pretty far away. No repair missions were planned. It was it's been up there for nine years, nine months, and 29 days. And but more than that, it's been sitting like I said at the L1 point, where it's in between the Sun and the Earth, where it is getting bombarded by coronal mass ejections on a regular basis. Uh, I, while it measures and looks at the sun, it has a lot of instruments. It looks at the, the chromosphere and like iron 9, 12, and 13, something like that. It also has three chronographs on board, uh, LASCO, C1, C2, and C3. Now, they don't use C1 very much, but C2 and C3, I was, I was poking around on their web page today, just discover, discovered, not observed, but discovered its 3,000th comet. So it has been up there for a long time. So we've got, we've, we've, this, there's a precedent for this. No repair missions. Now, Hubble's great. We, we spend every week talking about how great Hubble is. We're celebrating 25 years of Hubble being in orbit this year, which is an amazing feat. It's the longest space telescope to ever have done that. But SOHO, the Solar Heliospheric Observatory, has been up there. Will be t uh, it will be there 10 years. Uh, or No, yeah, t 20 years, actually, because this is 2015. I'm sorry, I have that wrong. 19 years it's been up now. So 20 years this December... Five years after the launch of Hubble Space Telescope, they launched SOHO. So, the next time you get all bent out of shape about L JWST being at L2, think about that for a second, because I think this is more of a solved engineering problem than anything else. So, I just had to get that out because, you know, I, I don't, I don't know about, I don't know about don't you. Don't get bent out of shape. <laughs> don't Uncle get, Tony says. Okay, that. okay, we got it. Tony, we got it. Yeah. All right, so let's get started with this week's Hangout. Uh, it was related to a previous conversation that we had, so I wanted to get that out. With me, as she is every week, always making fun of me, my colleague and friend, Dr. Carol Christian. She is the uh, Hubble Space Telescope Outreach Project Scientist. Hi, Carol. Welcome back. Hi. Glad to see you're in good form again. Thank you so much. Oh, you're so welcome. Also, also joining us, as he does each week, is the, the, em the em eminent Scott Lewis, Internet driver extraordinaire. Hi, Scott. Welcome back. Thank you, Tony. And and honestly, to, to defend Carol, which I don't often do, um, it's far too easy to make fun of you. Ah, that's very so true. So she's got her, she's got to work just right, right. Just, it's, it's low hanging fruit. I am an easy target. Okay, I, I, yeah, that's all right. Payback is a you know what. So okay, <laughs> all right, guys. I got. You. Always get it. Back. <laughs> I see how it's gonna be. But the thing is, you'll be ten years words, off so by the time it happens. Yeah. <laughs> December, you're going to be hearing all about. You're going to be hearing all about Soho. 20 years now. If I were their EPO, I'd be getting ready for a big party. But anyway, uh, okay. So as I mentioned, we're back back to Hubble and using the Hubble data. Astronomers at UC Irvine and other places have been using Hubble data to, like I said, look at the earliest galaxies in the universe, which is way better than the sun, in my opinion, also way better than anything. My my 
uh, the subject I covet the most early galaxies in the universe. And with me to talk about this is Dr. Steven Spiegelstein. He's an astronomer at the University of Texas at Austin. Hi, Steve. Welcome back. This is like you're, you, you're going to be a regular here on our Hangouts. <laughs> yeah. How you doing, Tony? <laughs> you're really good. Thank you. And Ket also joining me is uh, Ketron Mitchell Wynn. He is a, a PhD student at the uh, UC Irvine. He was part of the study that, we're going, that came out in, uh, uh, I guess it was earlier this month, right, Ketron? That's right, yeah. In well, the, last month now. It's in, it was a month. journal, Nature, what was it called? Nature Supplement or something like that? Uh, Nature Communications. Nature Communications, that's what it was. Okay, so let's take a, before we get to your actual observations and the uh, results from them, let's take a step back and talk about something that the Hubble has been doing for quite a while, which is these surveys. So these are sort of designed program, observa observation programs that, that Hubble does periodically. There's, they, they've been doing these with, uh, uh, right now, the, the main one going on is called Frontier Fields. It's looking at six different areas of the sky. Uh, but before that, there was uh, another one called Clash, and before that was one called Candles, which is the Cosmic Assembly Near Infrared Deep Extragalactic Legacy Survey. Somehow, that just seems like they were trying to make that work. But anyway, that's it. Candles. That's how. That's what Candles is. And you guys use Candles data for the survey, right, Ketrin? Uh, yeah, that's right. Okay, um, so so this wasn't uh, a data set that was designed for what it wasn't for you specifically to do this work, but you found that it was work. It was uh, observations that sort of enabled your work, correct? Yeah, we had to do this uh, complex mosaicing technique called self calibration. Um, and yeah, the, ca the candles data was collected in such a way to maximize, I think, uh, the area. Um, okay. But for us, that's not necessarily what we want. Um, but okay. when we supplemented the candles data with archive data, we had plenty to work with. Oh, really? So you used also data from the archive as well. Okay, Steve, let yeah. me get you. Well, Kate, why, don't, why don't you describe candles for us first? Can we start there? Yeah, sure. So. So CANDLES, you already spelled out the acronym. It's a long acronym, but it's uh, one of the largest, if not the largest, Hubble program ever. Uh, so back in the last decade, there was a big program called GOODS, which took optical imaging, so visible light that our eyes can see. They took those kind of images of a few regions of the sky and learned a lot of stuff about galaxies at, at sort of moderate redshifts from time, say, two to, 2 to 10 billion years after the Big Bang. Um, but if we want to go back closer to the Big Bang, we need to look in the near-infrared because the expansion of the universe has redshifted all of the ultraviolet and the visible light of those very distant galaxies completely out of the optical into the infrared. And so when Hubble installed, or when Hubble, when the astronauts installed the Wide Field Camera 3 infrared camera on Hubble in 2009, uh, one of the most obvious things to do was to go and try and do a similar survey in the near-infrared uh, it does take a long time, so there was a special call for very long proposals called multi-cycle treasury programs, uh, and one of the ones that was selected was Candles. You also mentioned Clash, which looked at lensing clusters, and also FAT, which looked at the Andromeda galaxy. Right. We just had a recent hangout on, uh, well, we've had hangouts on all of these, but yeah. It's, right. So they're called multi-cycle treasury programs. That's right, yeah. And uh, so Candles, the program Candles looked at five different regions uh, in the sky, um, all together, they're pretty small. They are uh, about one-fifth of a square degree. So it's actually, if you added them all together, it's smaller than the area of the moon. Um, but for extragalactic surveys, that's actually pretty huge. And so the survey is now done. Uh, the science is not done. We're still actively working on papers, like this great paper that Ketron wrote. Uh, but yeah, we've been, we've been learning a lot of great stuff about the universe. Oh, great. Okay. I am remiss, folks. As Steve was talking, I, remind, or I, I it occurred to me that I have not told you that we want you to interact with us in this Hangout. We want you to ask questions and leave comments. And you can do that in a variety of ways. Scott, if you're still around and I didn't lose you uh, from laughing at I'm me, uh, could, you, could, you, could you please explain to these to our kind viewers, how they may interact with us. Absolutely. So the, the best and easiest way for you to interact with us is while you're live here, on the bottom left screen on this stream is some yellow text that says that we are answering your questions live, which we are. So we have a Q&A app, and we're able to see uh, any questions or comments you leave there. You can upvote ones that other people have left. And so if we see anything really interesting that we want to address, we can click it. It will timestamp it when we're answering that question. So for those of you who are not watching live, you can see when those are being answered. Um, you can also interact with us on Twitter. So I'm live tweeting this 
uh, from at Hubble Telescope using the hashtag Hubble Hangout. So please send us your questions and comments on Twitter using that, and I will be, uh, if it's something really awesome, I'll retweet it or we'll be responding to them on air. And make sure to follow us because uh, we're always putting out really interesting oh, yeah. stuff there on Twitter too. And follow us over on, on YouTube. We are Hubble Site Channel on YouTube, and we're also on Facebook, so we have an event up there on Facebook. And we're also on Instagram at Official Hubble, and you can see some awesome pictures and, and visuals that we put up there. Yes, that's great. And I have been remiss in getting some public, some some pictures up on uh, Instagram. So thank you for reminding me about that. Oh, I, I got you covered. You, oh, of course you do. That's why you're here. <laughs> yeah, you got my back. All right, thank you. All right, so um, let's get back to these these. these I want to talk a little bit more about these multi-cycle treasury programs. And Carol, I was just wondering, can you is one of the things I've noticed with our hangout trends is we do talk a lot about these various surveys. We talked about fat before. We've talked about we've talked about frontier fields many times, and of course now we're on candles again. Is this kind of a trend? Do you think with using Hubble um, in this way, where we're kind of setting aside blocks of time for Hubble to do very specific, sort of large, larger scale observations? Well, it's a, it's a balance. I mean, when Hubble was first launched, everybody wanted to use the observing time, and there were lots of little projects. Um, and there are still many, many projects that only use a few orbits, because there's lots of interesting science like if you want to look at a specific exoplanet or you want to look at a stellar population of a specific galaxy. But surveys also um, are, are important, and it's, it's also important to look at um, many objects in a survey mode using the same instrumentation. And so the idea was that part of the time Hubble should be devoted to these um, multi-cycle treasury programs. The interesting thing about it is that the team is really responsible for the calibration and also the data becomes available ver very quickly um, because it's such a large amount of data. So the team that proposes the observation gets first crack at it, but they have to calibrate it and then put it out there in the archive to use. And what's been found is that what the original team thought they were going to do, they do, but then lots of other science can be done because there are several fields that are looked at that are pretty much uniform and address either galaxies or or like FAT, the Andromeda Galaxy. And so there's lots and lots of information in those observations that can tell us about all kinds of astrophysics. So they are very productive um, in it's terms a really of good use Hubble of, observations. Yeah, it sounds like yeah. a really good use of Hubble time. And, and so. the other thing is, like, it, it's kind of like we're always saying, okay, you know, Hubble won't live forever. It's been here 25 years. What do we have to do with Hubble? And when we, the Hubble project asked that of the community, they said, we want to do more surveys. So it's a response to the community interest as well. Oh, really? I did not know. Well, I, I, that explains why there's so many lately then. I don't recall in the early stage, the early days of Hubble, of course, I've not been around as, as long, but it, it seems to me like this is sort of a trend now. So it's, it's good to know. So well, is, you know what it started with? Your favorite observation. That's right. The, the Hubble, Hubble Deep Field. Deep field. The <laughs> very first one. The Wait, one Tony the likes the Deep Field? You want to get what? started on that? Let's talk this about the news. No, no, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, are you, all right, all right. I'll, I'll curb that, but I will instead of talking about uh, the Hubble Deep Field, we'll talk about the deepest galaxies we, that Hubble can see. So which brings me to, and as Carol's point, as Carol alluded to, uh, this candle survey was one of those things that had a lot of other science that could be done from it uh, than what it was in, in originally intended from. So Ketrin, tell us a little bit about what your work was, I mean, you, you started a little bit talking about this, this uh, mosaicing technique that you were doing, but uh, tell us a little bit about how you started this and what the science was, the driver behind it. Okay, um, I'll start how I started. Um, I started working on it two years ago. So, uh, Candles has a lot of data in the near infrared bands with the mod camera 3. Um, and we want to have a lot of uh, different ways of spinning uh, between the optical and the infrared. So we wanted to make five or six. Okay, so I'm getting, we're getting, are you guys hearing it being really broke up or is it just me? No, I can hear it too. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. So it sounds like you're you're really broken up, breaking up, Katrin. Can you? I don't know if there's a way to get on a wired connection or not, or uh, or what. But you're connected. You're you're breaking up, and we can't understand what you're saying. Is there? Yeah. A, 
All right, you can perhaps try getting out of the uh, Hangout and coming back in or just trying to plug in a, an Ethernet if you've got it. I'm not sure if that's possible or not. So uh, while you're doing that, so let me go to you, Steve. Do you have uh, – so what, what, can you tell us a little bit about your role in this research and uh, maybe, maybe if you happen to know some of the science drivers early on behind it? Sure, yeah. So um, the main thing we're after is – how many galaxies are out there in the very distant universe? Really, how much light are they putting out? Because we want to know how something happened that's called reionization. And so reionization is the process where the gas that's in between galaxies, and the universe is filled with gas in between the galaxies, um, basically lost all their electrons. So if this gas is mostly hydrogen, which just has one electron when it's neutral, uh, but nowadays if you go out and look at all that hydrogen gas between the galaxies, it's ionized. They've lost their electrons. It's just and a proton and a neutron then. Uh, just a proton. Just a proton. Just a bunch of protons, yeah. And so uh, we, we think that that happened, that process happened. So we, we know it had to happen early on because we could look pretty far back, even all the way out to a redshift of six or so, just a little over a billion years after the Big Bang, and everything is ionized. And we know from our theoretical understanding that it had to be neutral at some point. And so something had to ionize the gas. And this, is, this process is what we call reionization. And people have been debating back and forth for a long time about whether it was galaxies that produced the photons to do this or perhaps um, supermassive black holes that are accreting lots of material and being very energetic. Um, in the er now, we're still talking about the early universe, right? The early universe, yeah. So there were black holes around even at this stage. Well, so there's one at redshift 7. We found one at redshift 7, and we found several at redshift 6. Uh, but the current, So the current thinking is that there are not enough black holes, and so it must be galaxies. And so the other way to answer that question is count up the galaxies and see if there are enough. And this was one of the main goals of... Candles, it's also a main goal of the Hubble Frontier Fields, is counting up all the galaxies you can see and are they producing enough photons to actually do this reionization? And the answer is actually no. Uh, oh, really? But if, but if we extrapolate from what we see, so we measure the distribution of luminosities and then we just start, it's basically a histogram of galaxy brightnesses. And it just get cuts, gets cut off at some point because Hubble can't see that deep. But if we extrapolate that further down to where we think galaxies may exist, what simulations tell us, it is enough. But we would like to observe them because simulations have been wrong before, right? It's just a prediction. So that's what Ketron has been, has been doing. So you really want to see them, not just infer that they're there. We really want to see them. And so we're seeing some of them with the frontier fields. We'll see even more with JWST. We'll see even more with a JWST frontier fields program. Ooh. Even more, I don't know if you guys ever talk about the, the high-definition space telescope, if you've had a, a hang we're, on that. We're, we're going we're we're to be doing that a lot more as time goes on. We had, we've had one hangout on that already uh, yeah. in, in, in other forums. But, so, yeah. Uh, so um, I want to I wanna, – this, this idea of reionization is a, is a very, very interesting one to me. But it, but to, and I'm going to oversimplify it. But it is a stage in the history of the universe where – uh, hydrogen atoms that were once had all of their uh, it was basically permeated the, the most of the dominant matter in the universe lost that electron due to some mechanism. You're saying that it could be black holes, but there probably wasn't enough. And it might be the galaxies, but now you're saying probably not that either. Um, well, so, it, it, am, it, it am could I, be the galaxies. Right? We just yeah. Well, so, so well, we, we, we think it probably, it probably is the galaxies. Right. Well, it, we can't see the galaxies that are doing it. I see. So, so that may be a limitation more, of Hubble. Yeah, so there are way more uh, galaxies we can't see than we can see. Okay. That being said, that being said there was actually another recent paper that, that came out of candles, combining candles with Chandra X-ray data to show that perhaps there are a lot more quasars at higher redshift than we think, and maybe quasars could do it all. Okay. So yeah. that's very recent that that paper came out. Quasars in the early universe. So, we're, and, and what's the rough? And so, is the time period for this reionization like what the the the, the history of this uh, uh, particular uh, research paper around 500 million years after the Big Bang? Is that the kind of time scale we're talking about here? Yeah. So it's probably we don't know, but it was probably a process <laughs> that took a few hundred million years. And so our best constraints are reionization started, you know, maybe between redshift 10 and 12, and ended at redshift six. Okay, so there's, there is this need, then, to count as many as we can of the galaxies that existed in this period of the universe, uh, the universe's history, to determine if they were responsible for, could have the energy enough to throw away all, well, not throw away, but strip away these uh, electrons from the early hydrogen atoms. 
And this sounds like a, and you're using Hubble to do it with candles, among other things. I wanted to talk to Ketron about the method that he used with it, but uh, he hasn't returned yet. Is that something you could comment on? Uh, I can or? briefly comment uh, on, okay. on it. Uh, he will do a much better job than I will. So okay. I will use it. he's plugging in his Ethernet cable as we speak. Oh, okay. um, yeah, so uh, what he's trying to do, I know you guys had that graphic you popped up a little bit ago, those blue and red images. So if you take you know, all the galaxies that are below the, the quote, Hubble detection, then we can't resolve them, we can't see them. Hubble is actually still getting light from those galaxies. There's just a lot of noise in there. But those galaxies are distributed about the universe, not in a random way, but in a clustered way. Galaxies like to live where other galaxies like to live. Galaxies cluster. And so if you try to statistically look at the background and see if there's any kind of preferential clustering of the fluctuations of the background light in the image, you may be able to get a handle on what's left. And so they take something like the candles image and remove all of the actual galaxies that we can see and try and see what's left, essentially. Okay, so what are we looking at here? We've got three panels. Yeah, and so, so, so we, we should ask Ketron again when he gets online. But oh, the left, panel, okay, all right. the left blue one is the actual candles image, and then the two right panels are two components of what is left after you take out the galaxy. So all those little white dots in the left image, you, you can remove them, or, you, or you, at the very least you mask them out. That's actually what the holes are in the middle and the right panel. Right. Yeah, some of those dark holes correspond to some of the big sources. So you just mask those out. You say, I don't have any information here. It's all blocked out by a nearby galaxy. And then you really just pump up what's left. Yeah, and so it turns out there are two components. The middle component uh, was discovered, at least to my knowledge, or at least robustly discovered last year, where it was found that some of this background fluctuation is actually due to essentially homeless stars, so stars that have been stripped out of their galaxies due to gravitational encounters, those kind of free-floating stars out there in the universe. Uh, but what Ketron was able to do with candles with the unique wavelength range and depth probed by candles was show that there was a second component from galaxies that had to be coming from the very early universe. Okay, so that's the, that the, right hand panel. Just, just to put a little bit of context here, this leftmost panel is a extremely teeny tiny little square of the sky. We're talking about a very tiny amount here. Ah, good, he looks like he's back. Yeah, sorry about that. And uh, that's quite all right. We can hear you much better now. Um, I've got some more questions for you, and, and we're just kind of explaining what's going on. So this was, we're, what we're looking at in this panel, and, and Steve was giving us a little bit of background on what we're looking at, uh, but I was just trying to get some context. This, When it says sky, we're looking at a real teeny tiny portion of the sky. So why don't you describe for us, where, where I'd like to learn a little bit about what you did to uh, to sort of do the statistical analysis with this data. And and Steve has already said that you've taken the stars here and the ones that have been, when you call them tidally stripped, these are stars that, that are meant to be ripped away from their host galaxies. Mm -hmm. And what we're left with is what's in the in the center uh, the center panel. And right. then and then you did something and I missed it about to get us to the to the right panel. Yeah, so actually actually both of those the Second and third panels are both reconstructions, actually, of model fits that we did. So, after I made mosaics and all. Oh, wait a minute. So, wait. You applied a model to what? The background of this of the leftmost image. Uh, that's right. Yeah. So, well, a masked version of that sky. So mm -hmm. after we removed all of the the point sources, uh, we we isolated the background light, and the statistics comes in because we do what's called the angular power spectrum. Um, it's very similar to what they did for the CMB. Uh, that's, a, that's a Fourier transform technique, right? Yeah, exactly, yeah. Right. Yeah, so on, on, on small areas, it's a Fourier transform. On larger areas, it's just a decomposition of the sky into the spherical harmonics. Yeah. Okay. So and and so this is this is a technique, folks, where if you have something that looks like a lot of noise, if there's any pattern in there, uh, it'll come out in one of those kinds of uh, transforms. So. Uh, so you did that. We did that, and then we have a power spectrum measurement for all these different bands. Uh, and then Asantha and his postdoc applies these relatively complicated uh, theoretical models, and they fit the data with their models. Okay. And so once once they fit the data, they give me a, um, basically the model parameters, and then what I do is I invert the power spectra from those models back to real space, and you can see 
in the second and third figures what. Oh, and then you what count up. Like. Okay. Oh, I get it now. All right. So you start with the background image of the sky and candles. We get rid of the stars. You do a Fourier transform of, or power. Get a power spectrum of it. You apply mm -hmm. a, a model which says, look, if your power spectrum looks like this, then you have this many galaxies in it, and your galaxy model will look like what. I say, and then you took the, that model and said, okay, good. Well, this is what we have. The power spectrum does look like this model. Let me invert it back into space, and I will show you, and there's the, and there's the galaxies, and then you count them all up. That's right, yeah. Okay. So, um... And that whole process cool. took two years. <laughs> and that whole... <laughs> but that's still really cool. I mean, I like that. That's real, So that is how... And how, Okay, so this is stuff... That's down in the noise of an image. When you talk about a background of an image, this is stuff where everything is like you don't know if you're looking at noise with from the sky or from the instrument or from Hubble or from whatever, or if you're looking at actual signal. Is did you get that from the Fourier transform? Is that how? Yeah. You... Well, we're looking at correlations, so a lot of the noise is uncorrelated. So what I did is I made. Well, you have to uh, describe what you mean by that. What do you mean the noise is uncorrelated with what? Uh, with itself. So noise is did, not correlated with itself. That's the definition. It's so of meta. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so so what I did is I made uh, two different images of the same area of sky for each filter. So what I would do is I would take one image that has the exact same sky area as the other, like to the pixel they're aligned. But but different filters. Same filter or different filter, but let's oh. let's just talk about the auto power spectra. So for the same filter, I would make two maps, and if I if I took the power spectrum of those two maps together, then what would happen is that the the uncorrelated noise would drop out of it. Okay. If that makes sense. Yes, I think well enough that, in, a, in a sense enough I think so okay so you were able to, and that gives you you obviously have some confidence level then in what you're what you've got here. Yeah, sure. So, so to to get the basically the noise power spectrum is I would subtract those two maps from each other, and that in principle would take out the astrophysical signal, and then I would take the power spectrum of that, and I would get the galaxies. It. And to that would the model. It, well, that would be our error bars, part of our error bars. Oh, oh, okay, good, awesome. Well, good. All right, so. Um, in a minute, I want to get to what your answer was and what you found after doing all of that. But Woot uh, van der Heide is asking, and, that, and Scott, if you wouldn't mind, I had asked you to grab a, a diagram uh, for me that sort of shows the. Oh, you've got something else up. What do you got up? Is that, is that what it is? No, no. We'll get. We'll come right back to that. But if I could get you to put up that map for me um, or that diagram for me, he is asking, and I want to go back to this this period of reionization because it's important. He's asking when and how did reionization occur. Now, let, this diagram kind of shows a history of the universe. This is one of my favorite kind of uh, descriptions of of the way in which things happened in the universe. So Steve, can you give us some sense of where in this thing the reionization would lie? Uh, I think, I'm reading it right now, it looks like the second slice from the right, the kind of purple one, where sort of the first galaxies are forming. That's so so yeah. this part where it says structure formation, that's sort right. of what we're talking about here. And and uh, so we're looking, you know, this is what, about a billion years or so after the Big Bang. And the, if you go backward, you see all kinds of very strange things happening, not the least of which is inflation, but that's a little outside of the order of this thing. But this is when we're talking about uh, in the history of the universe. So about a billion, a little bit before that, years uh, after the Big Bang. As far as how reionization occurred, that's what we're trying to figure out now, right, guys? That's right. So as what Steve was saying, uh, it, they thought that it could be due to black holes, uh, could be doing this, but then there probably wasn't enough this early on in the universe's history, and now they're trying to determine if there are enough galaxies uh, in the early universe to have had the energy to do this. And uh, and what Ketron's been doing is try to figure out, using these Fourier al analysis techniques and modeling, uh, how many there were. So you've got your error bars, Ketrin. You've got you've you figured out. Uh, you've probably got a pretty good idea of of in your little slice of sky there. How many galaxies did you find? Well, what's the uh, so what'd you find out? How many are, are there enough galaxies? Do you think uh, to do this kind of reionization? And how many are there? Uh, yes, there are enough. Um, we found that there are uh, an order of ten times as many 
as we previously thought. Ten times more galaxies than what everybody thought before. Yeah. So a, a typical deep survey um, for Hubble usually takes really long integrations over a smaller area. And what they pick up is really the brightest sources at these really old epochs. But okay. what we're doing is picking up a signal from kind of the more char characteristic population. That's, okay. That's not as bright. So is what Scott's showing now uh, describing that? Um, what, are we, what is this showing, actually? I don't get it. Yeah, so the, this is uh, uh, the brightness of the background light as a function of uh, wavelength. So this Wavelengths star, at the bottom and brightness, okay. Yeah, that's right. So the star formation rate um, is, is directly proportional to the amplitude of our power spectra, and that's shown with those yellow points. So the two rightward yellow yellow points are the WIF-C3 bands, and those are the two bands where we're picking up this high Yeah. Yeah. And then you go to the shorter bands, and the signal just totally drops out, and that doesn't contain any high redshift component in it. So based on the amplitude of that brightness, we can kind of deduce um, the amount of star formation that's going on. Which tells you then how many galaxies there are. Yeah, that's right. I'm trying to get to the connection between the galaxies. What's that red line there? That just peaks at the near infrared? What? What's the wave? I can't see because everybody's thumbnails. What's the wavelength? Yeah. Um, that's, that's right around one micron. Oh, those are microns. Okay. It's one Right above one micron. Okay, good. So it peaks right around Mach 1 micron, and so this is where Candles was giving you a lot of data. You said you also used uh, archive data for this as well? Yeah, I did. So uh, Steve mentioned uh, the Goods survey. So this That's the, the survey before Candles. Yeah, that's right. I think in 2004, uh, Gia Velisco had a lot of observations in the Advanced Camera for Survey, the ACS instrument uh -huh. on, on Hubble. So... Uh, what actually happened, um, I th think on the fourth servicing mission of Hubble, they replaced uh, the readout box for ACS, and that introduced some correlated noise into the instrument. So we actually couldn't use that much candles data from ACS because of that. So we had to use archive data. And okay. um, we used the majority of the ACS data is from the archive. From between 2001 and 2011, I think. Okay. All right, so you found 10 times more galaxies than were previously thought in this period of the universe. You think there's more than enough now to come to, uh, to uh, understand the, uh, I don't know if I should say the engine of reionization or not, but something that at least there's, an ex there's a driver behind some of it at least. Um, what... It, can you? Does, would it be helpful to go back any further than this per particular period that Candles was looking at, or is this pretty much as far back as you need to go? And by far back, I mean, yeah, cosmologically uh, earlier in the universe. Uh, is this about as? Do, would it help to go any further back? Well, if we could, we would. Uh, and why can't you? you well, the, set, this, the set right. <laughs> Right, so but you know, you see where I'm going with this. You've pretty much reached the limit of where Hubble can, at least in terms of candles, can do. Carolyn, they haven't got funding for their TARDIS yet, so yeah. they're waiting. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I mean, I don't, I, Carol, I don't know if you know this or not, but is it possible to do anything more with this? Do you think with the Frontier Fields? Because Frontier Fields is cheating a little bit. Frontier Fields is using lenses, galaxy lenses, to kind of boost the power of Hubble. Is there a chance you think maybe this by cheating well, you mean science? I think yeah, no. I think our guests are better suited to answer. Sure, but sure. The, the thing is that yeah, it looks back. Um, part of the thing, I mean, for me, thinking about the frontier fields data, you've got this lensing stuff going on. So talking about how you're going to handle the instrumentation and how you're going to subtract out the lens galaxies and then the behind galaxies and see what noise you have left, um, I would think it would be possible, but you should yeah, I would what do you well, well what do you think? Good lens models to do that. What do you think, Ketrin? Are you do you think Maybe uh, Ketrin and Steve are less shy than I am about that kind of data? <laughs> Does that complicate things? Having to undo the the lensing models with uh, with with frontier fields would that help you at all or no? Um, well, I think that's a fundamentally 
different technique than what we're doing here, but it people do do that. Yeah. Okay. All right. So probably not is, is basically it. So well, I think I think the bigger issue there, and Ketron can correct me if I'm wrong, is that the area that you get for each frontier fields cluster is much smaller yeah. than one of the candles okay. fields, and okay, so you so. would basically yeah, you're going a little deeper. Um, but I think it's yeah, it's not really adding that much area. And then you know you have to mask out everything that's in the image, and there's a lot more galaxies in an image of a galaxy cluster than in the candles field. And so not only are you starting from a smaller image, you then have to mask a bunch of it out, and so you're just losing a bunch of space. You're losing more pixels. Okay, um, so 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 candles really was the ideal data set to help with this with this kind of research then, not yeah. not so yeah, much. I think you kind of need an unex unobstructed view, and that's why. Telescopes like JWST and the High Definition Space Telescope are of interest because if you want to keep picking away at this problem um, down at this level of noise, um, you really need more powerful, bigger telescope and and more powerful. I'm so happy you went there, Carol. So let's talk about that for a second, <laughs> Ketrin, Can you comment on that just a little bit? I mean, the the so we've done we've done. Um, a lot of work with Hubble, about as much as Hubble can do with this kind of research, with finding these early galaxies. Uh, in what way does it help? Let me ask you this. I know JWST is probably going to be able to help in this way, but in what way are you helping JWST? I want to start there first. Um, directly or indirectly? Well, indirectly. I mean, aren't you kind of setting the stage for the signatures and the early work that if, if, if Hubble, if you push JWST, for example, like you do Hubble, and you use right. this technique, you can help JWS team a little bit uh, with its uh, maybe pushing the boundaries a little bit. Am I wrong? Yeah, hopefully. I okay. hope that's the case, yeah. Okay. Um, maybe they'll be inclined to accept proposals with this kind of observation pattern. I see. Okay, good. So, uh, and of course, then the next question is, is JWST going to help with this? Oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> Sorry. There's a chance that they could even resolve these individual galaxies, but... Yeah, because right now, what you're looking at in noise or in background, I shouldn't call it noise, uh, is JWST might actually be able to resolve, correct? Yeah, this is so everything I do is unresolved. It's just blobs of over and under densities. Right, that's an important point because you're relying on these power spectra to point out the features uh, right. of these things for you and to, to identify them in these models to sort of unravel what you're looking at. But here, JWST will actually provide observations, correct? Yeah, and the resolution and the sensitivity is going to be so much higher that they might even resolve them individually. And then, of course, after that, we've got even bigger HDST, as Carol pointed out, coming out. So, what about W well, first, Carol? That's, Do you think that's what Steve, Steve was talking about, is that it, you know, you're know picking away at this problem, and then you... you. So I think what's being said here is that you can infer that those objects exist but you really want to see them. That's right. That's a good point. So right now we're inferring, based on power spectra, that they're there, and models that suggest, yeah, they should be there, but we haven't actually put our fingers on them yet and said, yes, there's one. And that's where the frontier fields can help out. They're not going to see them all, but uh, uh, we are, we're working on the frontier fields in my group, and we're finding a lot of very, very faint galaxies that oh, good. fainter yeah. than Hubble was able to see before. So. Maybe we can do another hangout on that sometime. Of course. Yeah. Write that yeah. paper. We haven't done a Frontier Fields one in a while, so yes, I'd definitely like to talk a little bit more about what's going on there. So that's great. That's great news. Okay. Uh, w first. You mentioned W first. W first would also be very useful uh, for these types of analyses because it's got to be that's, very, that, very wide fields. That's right. Good. I'm glad you – because that's going to be – the reason I wanted to bring it up was because that's going to be before HDST. So, right. uh, so, yeah. w, so W first will uh, be able to contribute to this quite a bit, actually, I would imagine, because it can look at huge areas of the sky. Yeah, absolutely. It can look at huge areas, but it's a, it's a Hubble-sized telescope, but a single, a single picture with W first is something like uh, 100 times the area of a single picture with Hubble. So, Ketrin, I know this is a loaded question, but the the uh, you're a PhD, you're on track, you're a grad student, ready to become a PhD. Are you uh, are you excited about using uh, JWST and then following by W first? And uh, are you going to be getting your PhD soon? <laughs> uh, uh, oh, that's yeah. a terrible question. Are you getting yeah. your PhD yeah. soon? God. It's not a terrible question. Are you on track? Are you? Are you yeah, I, I, actually, I think I, I'll probably get it. about it. Next year, we're gonna mute you if you, you're not. So <laughs> I'm gonna refer you to PhD Comics and think yeah. you should not ask your grad student. <laughs> I said it was a loaded question, and I did not mean it in any other way other than the way I said it. So good. Um, 
Uh, well, that's so that's so good because the reason this you're the generation of astronomers. I point this out because you're the generation of astronomers for which JWST is prime suited to help. And I just uh, wanted to know how what your thoughts are on the possibilities of using a telescope like that. Uh, yeah, I mean it, it. It would be very amazing uh, <laughs> if I had the opportunity. Uh, but I guess it's a few years away. Um, Twenty eighteen. Yeah. yeah. So you've got time. See, you no yeah. worry. Get your, get your you can you got time to finish. <laughs> yeah, I, I'll probably finish before that, um, and hopefully there are postdoc opportunities that would allow such a study. Good. All right. Well, that's good to know, and I wish you best of luck in the in the in the in the course of your research. And I and this particular result is I find uh, a very fascinating one. So I want to thank you for taking the time out to talk to us about this. Um, let me look and see if I can find any. Uh, um, uh, the Q&A app just to come, oh, evening Hubble Huggers, yes, good evening Hubble Huggers, or good afternoon, depending on your, your time, uh, your time. Well, I had, I had a question in trying to um, understand the way that the data is handled. So, are there, are, are you, are you having to deal with a lot of calibration and instrument effects to make absolutely sure that what you are seeing is a real signature from an astrophysical, you know, d density of astrophysical objects. I mean, it seems like when you work around in the noise like that, it's, it's very difficult. Yeah, that's, so, that's a good question. How do you know? That well, we do oh, simulations. Okay. So I, I'll do... So we have a huge collection of these raw individual exposures, which make up a small subsection of the whole mosaic. Oh, okay. So what I'll do is I'll inject some signal into these, into these individual frames, a signal that I know very well, and then I'll mosaic them, and then okay. I will see how well my mosaicing routine is removing offsets and things like this. And then I'll take that into consideration with the final power spectra and add the error. The total error budget is also a function of that, of those simulations. So I spent probably four or five months just running simulations to kind of quantify the noise and get a hold on the different errors. So, and, I mean, I think this is an important point about the way that, you know, you just don't take in an observation and voila, you have this amazing result, is that there's there's you know, getting the data, calibrating it, make sure it's the best data, you can mm -hmm. clean it as best you can. Then you have the modeling, which is trying to look at what the astrophysics underlying. And then, in a lot of things, you do simulations where you put a known thing in, you see if you can get back out, and that, and that kind of thing. I think it's, it's, it's interesting that that shows up in many different areas of astrophysics in trying to understand the data that, that comes out. Yeah, and also what I was talking about before, how I had two images uh, for each field, for each yes. filter. So when I subtract those two images from each other, all the astrophysical signal should go away, and it, it does. Should. It that's should, true. and it does. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's good. That's good. That's yeah. good. But it, okay. yeah, it, it is a very long process from uh, the initial exposure to the final results. All right, got a got a dark. Go ahead, Carol. Are you done? Oh well, well, I had one. Yeah, one other question in trying to understand. So, so if you tried to do this with one field, it would be a little. More, I would think. I don't know. Would be a little more difficult. But the fact that you have these mosaics and that you have s several data sets allows you to understand the instrument better. Then it it seems like the instrument you would be able to understand the signature of the instrument itself pretty well, so that you know you're not being fooled by some funny effect from the instrument. Right, and actually, you had mentioned ACS, right, that there was a change, and then it, it, it wasn't yeah. so forward. Yeah, there's this um, Eureka package that a big group of smart people at Space Telescope are writing. That's which, right. Which, I mean, it's really amazing, because they, they're basically doing all of the hard work. They're finding all of these things that you're talking about, the instrumental effects, and finding ways to kind of ameliorate all of the different things that could go on. So I, I'm just running Python scripts that call these functions that people smarter than me have already written. That's right. It's really, called, no, you that, that that's a big effort here at the institute. It's called Eureka, yeah. U R E K A, and it's a really important astronomy develop or software package for people who use Hubble data. 
-hmm. So that, I'm glad glad you gave the shout out. I'm sure they'll appreciate it. <laughs> I was using it today earlier. Not uh, even for mobile data. Yay! Another, in, another yeah. endorsement. Oh, good. Uh, they'll be happy to hear that. That's with our science software branch here at the Institute, so that's really great. I have a dark matter question from Michael Jobin. Hi, Michael. Welcome back. I'm always glad to see your questions. He wants to know, how do we know dark matter is as a kind of particle only or not just some bodies of some sort that we can't see yet? But you want to comment on that, Steve, maybe? Or <laughs> is it a... How do, sure. how do we so know I it's a particle? A minute, I, I saw that question a minute ago, and I was like, oh, that's a really good question. Uh, <laughs> So yeah, we always get good uh, questions on this. Particle physicists will provide a much better answer, but I will provide an astrophysical answer, which is we can see that the densities in the centers of galaxies are really high, and this is just a guess, but I'm guessing that if it was due to actual regular matter, like say a bunch of asteroids or something like that, there would have to be so many that either A, you would see them, or B, they would prevent things from moving around in their orbits. So stars and other things would be smashing into it all the time and that would cause things to glow and we would see it. Good question. So that, is, that is an answer. <laughs> there that are probably an better answers. <laughs> That's right. There's a lot about dark matter we're still trying to find out. So according to the press release I was just reading here, and the next area open for, that follows from what you guys are doing is that you want to kind of look in the x-rays next uh, to see what's going on with some of this primordial stuff that's out there uh, because the earliest stars uh, they were they were very large and they collapsed really quickly uh, because they were so large and so um, and so they did this thing called a, what was it? I forget the name now is it core uh, core collapse I forget when well, no, I forget the kind of supernova it was it was a, a very special kind anyway and, and those would show up in uh, the X rays so are there any plans for you guys to be doing some X ray work or is that other members of the team. Uh, I I actually just sent a draft around about X ray cross correlations yesterday. To the oh. collaborators. So yeah, we are we are doing that. Um, we are cross-correlating X-ray background maps with the maps that I made in Hubble. So the idea is that if if there's a black hole signature in the really early universe, they would leave imprints on the cosmic infrared background, which is what we have maps of. So if we cross-correlate maps between the near infrared and the X-ray, then if there's a strong correlation, that that kind of hints that maybe the the possibility is is true. Oh boy, this is one of those moments where I just, you know, I just hit it just hit me. Of course there would be a background infrared map. All I ever think we always think about is microwave background, you know, we always think about that. But there, is there is, is this this infrared map is it is it a whole sky thing or is it most of the sky or No, it's the it's what we've been talking about. It's the it's the, the whole, Hubble maps. The, the Hubble maps, the whole yeah. the whole cluster, the whole candles field then, the whole cluster survey. Well, I after all of the work that I did to try to get mosaics in all the fields, I can only do it in two fields. Okay. Because right. it's kind of a data constraint. Um, cool. But yeah, basically just cross-correlating with the maps that I already have from the work that I did in this paper, um, I can just cross-correlate with x-ray maps and investigate oh. that. Very good. Okay, well, that's great. All right, well, I don't know if there's any other... Uh, quick, Scott, is there anything I'm missing on Twitter? Anything you want to point out or are we good to go? No, I think we're pretty good, actually. Okay, all right. All right, folks, well, I guess that'll do it this week. Um, next week, we have a, uh, a hangout plan for you that I'm going to have. I, Carol, I don't get what it says, AU Mick. Can you describe what that, <laughs> what that was? What, what's, what do we got next week? AU Mick is, uh, well, I also want to say NASA is, is uh, pushing a little bit in October. Um, the exoplanet research, there's a, also the Division of Planetary Science having a meeting and all that. So um, AU Mech was known to have is an exoplanet system. It is known to have a disk. And it has been observed both by Hubble and other instrumentation and um, seems to have some funny things about the disk. And so this we're gonna we're going to talk with the authors about how they use the Hubble data and what they are learning about this disk. You know, this one isn't, it's not like, oh, oh it has a disk. You know, it's, it's known to have a debris disk. And so it's like they're now kind of looking at it and seeing. This is another case also of using multiple telescopes, observing something over a period of time. So it, it shows why that kind of um, research is worthwhile. So it's, it's basically about an exoplanet. 
and that is next week, folks. So we hope you'll join us. I want to thank I want to thank you guys for I want to thank our guest uh, Ketra Mitchell Wynn. He's uh, uh, from UC Irvine. Thank you so much for taking the time out to talk to us about your research. It's been this is awesome stuff, and I hope you'll come back after you do the X-ray stuff and yeah. uh, and follow up. Okay, and good All luck right, to thanks, you. Buddy. And good luck to you, Ivan. Right. Thanks for and Dr. Stephen Finkelstein. He's also the astronomer from University of uh, Texas at Austin. Thank you, Steve, for coming back. It's always great to have you on our hangouts. And he's going to be back with us at the end of the month. So, That's, well, I was I didn't look that far ahead. Is that true? Great, uh, outstanding. Well, I look forward to talking to you again, Steve. <laughs> Absolutely, it'll be good. All right, all right, so, all right Carol, Scott, thank you very much. Uh, that's Thanks, it for this. Paul. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Uh, that's it for this week's folks. Thank you all for watching. And as always, and don't forget about Soho. I'm telling you. <laughs> don't forget uh, about Soho. That's right. <laughs> 20 years. No, we're no. Forgetting word. about Soho was a no no. Yeah, <laughs> Soho no no. <laughs> don't be a right. Soho no no. All right, that's it. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're done. Bye -bye. We're, we're done. done. Thank you all for watching. Bye -bye. See you next week, everyone. Keep looking up.